So we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to the Beaches Watch monthly meeting. We are excited to have Scott Shine here as our guest speaker, who is our representative for the Duval County Public Schools District 2. So he will give us the good, the bad, the ugly of what's been going on with uh, our, our schools and um, those, now not the search, but uh, the uh, new superintendent who is uh, starting. And so he is here, but he Second. So I just have a few brief announcements to make. Um, I'm Maria Mark. I'm the interim president <coughs> of Beaches Watch, and I'm happy to welcome you guys here for our monthly meeting. Um, Beaches Watch, for those who do not know our organization, we are a nonprofit, um, uh, nonpartisan civic organization, and our mission is to educate and inform our beaches citizens on issues uh, that will affect our quality of life here. So we promote and we encourage, highly encourage citizen uh, involvement in, with your local governments, your local uh, uh, elected officials, and uh, so you can take part in the decisions that are being made that directly affect your lives. Um, our, we are a membership organization, so uh, membership dues that are, that are paid go back into the community uh, in several different ways. We have our give back donation where we recognize um, uh, individual organizations who have uh, gone above and beyond their, their uh, mission to, to really improve the quality of life in our community. We've also started um, a scholarship for the Fletcher uh, High School students, uh, for seniors. Um, I think we just awarded our second annual scholarship just recently. Um, and we also have our uh, Friends of the Beaches Award, where we also recognize the same type of individuals and organizations that have really um, gone above and beyond and contributed to the quality of life for our rep for us who live at the beaches. Um, before we get started, we'd like to always recognize our, our elected officials. As we all know, it's typically a thankless job, so we feel like it's really important to recognize them. So uh, we have Mayor um, Ellen Glasser from Atlanta Beach. Library, spent a lot of time here 
it's interesting, normally there's only about five or six people that show up for the education discussion, so now I'm a little nervous. Why, why? <laughs> uh, first thing is we have big news with the superintendent. Uh, we have hired and we do have a contract with uh, Dr. Diana Green. She's currently a superintendent down in Manatee Schools. Um, there were a number of applicants that we looked at, uh, and uh, she was the only one that had really uh, uh, unanimous uh, support right from the get-go. Uh, what's interesting is she was the only candidate who uh, has served as a superintendent in a school in Florida. Uh, and she's also done some things that are going to be critical to the future of our school system in Duval County. She's actually worked to increase revenue in her county as well as close and consolidate schools. And she has a good track record uh, for, for performance. So uh, uh, looking forward to, uh, to what she's going to bring to the table. Uh, she is an alumni of the University of North Florida. So yeah, so we got one coming home and that's, that's cool. But uh, she's very likable. And uh, she also has a very strong presence in Manatee County with community organizations, with the chamber, other governmental agencies. That's something that was also very intriguing about her background. So she's a very external uh, person in terms of her outlook, not just internal. Something too often we do in education is just simply look inside the organization. Uh, so that, that's good news. She'll be starting on July uh, 2nd. And uh, next, uh, uh, the, uh, the budget. And I'm going to run through this pretty quick. I really do want to make this a conversation where we can take some questions and have some dialogue. Uh, the budget, some of you folks may have heard about the budget. And this is an ongoing issue in how we manage our school system, which is really not, you know, a lot of people say run it like a business. Um, how many businesses would not know what their cash flow looks at, looks like until uh, six weeks or sometimes a couple of uh, months before you, you know, start your next year? Well, that's what our system looks like. Every year the legislature approves a new budget. And so we don't know what how much money we're going to get until they make that decision. This year, uh, supposedly, we have 42 cents more per student. Now, um, if you look at the math, and it's interesting, the legislature has different math than Politifax and our uh, CFO. So uh, we're still kind of trying to figure out how much money we really have. So at this point, there's a belief that we're about $62 million short. Why? Um, I've been told by our administration this has to do with now having a correct and honest budget. And I have no reason not to believe what they're telling us. So apparently, some of what happened in the past, we were borrowing from some accounts to make the, the, the books balance. Long story short, where I am as a board member, we have uh, a separation of power between the administrative branch and the legislative branch, which is the school board, we're policy makers, we're, we're the agency responsible for funding school. We have what's called board auditor. In fact, city council, they have a council auditor. Most legislative bodies have that uh, entity because they're responsible for finance. Well, our board auditor left that job to become the CFO. So we now do not have a board auditor and we have that person in the other position which has created some problems. And I have not been able to get any real response as to when are we going to fill that their auditor position uh, at this time. So I, I'm not completely comfortable with that dynamic. Also, where we've been, you know, when I started out in the district, we had somewhere around $30 million in surplus. And then we had $25 million. And then we had negative $20 million, which was really 17 which was the first number they gave me, and now it's 60. So it's almost like somebody's spinning a wheel, how much money do we really have today? And, and that in and of itself tells me that our financial house is, is not in order. Uh, another problem that we've run into with financing is our relationship, education in general, and the state legislature. It's very contentious. A lot of people don't want to admit that, but it's the truth. And the legislature does not have a high degree of trust and local school boards. So what they're doing is they are managing uh, uh, schools through legislation and through budgeting. And this is not uncommon. Uh, frequently, if, uh, if if an agency or organization is not happy, like a, a mayor, we you know, 
when Albert Brown was mayor, the council wasn't happy with everything he was doing, they began to enact uh, specific uh, legislative items that affected the administration. Not really appropriate, but uh, sometimes that happens. So what they are doing in the legislature is they are earmarking money for specific things. So supposedly we have more money than we ever had before, but that money is earmarked specifically for certain programs. And some of these are very good programs, like they're helping disabled students. Safety, which is now a big issue, and we'll talk more about, about that in the future. But that's a challenge. The other challenge that we run into in financing is where we are as a district. So we, we know about the beaches, and we know about our schools out here. A lot of them are relatively new, although Fletcher uh, High School is slated to be replaced at some point in the future when we uh, get the money and we get a plan uh, in place to actually do that. But in the urban core, we have as many as 23,000 empty seats in aging schools. We have the oldest infrastructure in the state. Now, to put that in perspective, 23,000 empty seats, the average school district in this country is about 10,000 seats. Okay, about two and a half times uh, the number of empty seats. And the problem is, how do you close schools when that's an anchor in that community for both um, social and economic uh, development? And there's an emotional attachment to schools. You know, I went back on Google Earth the other day and looked at my old elementary school in Bonnier, Virginia, and they tore it down. I'm still mad. But you know, <laughs> that, that's the thing is, we are connected with our schools. It's more than just a building, and, uh, and that's been a problem. We're going to have to do something. We can't continue to waste money. You know, when we get, uh, we, we have to approve every contract that comes in uh, for uh, uh, capital improvements on building. And, and the other day we had a new roof to be put on one of these buildings. And the, and, and the building should be torn down and rebuilt at least. And, but when the rain's coming in on kids, you gotta put on a new roof. So that's a 30 year roof on a building that's obsolete today. And those kinds of things happen. It really comes down to the political courage to do something with this. Part of that is funding it. How do you fund it? Um, Dr. Beatty, when he was here, he looked at that issue and they came up with the number of a billion dollars. Now, what's a billion dollars cost you in terms of a bond rate? That could be about $50 million a year. Now, what's interesting, we're in the whole 60. So, if, if you look at what ground we're making up financially, we really are uh, treading water right now. And the legislature, where will they be in the future? I, I don't know that they're going to come back and uh, really make any significant changes in terms of funding uh, public schools. We'll talk about that dilemma in a second. But their uh, motivations are around reform. And this is a way to enforce reforms into the system. Um, academics. Let's talk about some good news. Uh, academics in Duval County, we're at the highest level we've ever been in the history of the city. In fact, there's a study called the NAEP study. They look at large urban school districts. And one of the things that's important is we're often compared to other counties, like St. John's County. Um, that's really not a fair comparison. We know there's a lot of relationships between academic achievement data and the economics of the community that the children come from. It's, it's basically family uh, stability. Uh, it's funny because we talk about statistics. Well, what's the story behind the statistics? One is that if someone reads to the child in the home, they're more likely to develop good reading skills. If both parents read to the child, even better. Well, what's that tell you? They got two parents in the household. A lot of these households don't. So that's a lot of times what you're really measuring is the performance of the teachers or the challenges in those communities. But in the NAEP survey, which looks at large urban school districts, we're basically the top school district in the country. And we do have some outstanding scores around, especially on improvement with the African American community, African American males, as well as uh, special needs children. Um, so there's a lot of good news there. On another note, uh, one of the things that's happening, and I do want to get this out to the, to the population, because I've I'm, I'm, uh, got about five months left in this job. We have become very testing driven. And in Florida, we're not doing too bad a job because we've kind of limited the subjects that we're testing. We focus mostly on math and English. And what happens is we're seeing a lot of uptick in these scores. So it's that 
kids are getting better education, more education, they're getting smarter, or is it that we're getting better at delivering the test? Here's an example. So when we look for a new curriculum, we used Engage New York. One of the primary reasons we use that is because it's aligned, it's curriculum aligned with the test. So the test typically drives what curriculum you're, you're going to choose. Is that the right decision? I don't know. But is it because it's great for kids, or it's what they need to know, or is it because it's what's on the test? So you start to see, and I, I use the word gaming. Um, there are other places in the system, and we do this, and all the other districts do it. We're living and dying by these numbers, where you do things to make your numbers better. So if a child is in one system, and they're not doing that well, is there a way to move them to another place they might not be counting? get too heavy into that. Sometimes moving them to an alternative school like a graduation program, uh, that, that, a school that's focused on graduation, can actually bring those numbers up. Um, but there is a good bit of gaming in the system. All in all, I think both things are happening. I think we're getting better um, at teaching our students. Uh, my son just graduated last year and uh, he lost me on homework at about third grade. So, I mean, there, there are, what you learn today in school, you're getting good education. Uh, how are we doing with those children that struggle? I'm not so sure. And how are we preparing them in terms of life skills? Are we really making that happen? Uh, so good news on uh, academic achievement. Let's talk about Ocean County. Yeah. <laughs> um, if you took basically District 2, which goes all the way to Kernan Boulevard, and you said it's a county, and said, okay, where does it rank academically in the state of Florida? It ranks number two behind St. John's County. And it ranks number two behind St. John's County by about one and a half percent. Do you have great schools at the beach? You have great schools at the beach. So the best in the country. The other thing that's interesting is when you look at these numbers, we have a big magnet program. We also have a big what we call choice. We also have alternative delivery. Among them, things like homeschool, we're one of the top uh, cities in the state for homeschool. But what's interesting, if you look at things that, that are caused in that dynamic, um, some of your best students, your 100% graduation, your A students, they're down in a magnet, they're not standing. Um, or they might be homeschooled. So we're not counting them. That, that actually pushes our numbers down uh, in, in certain districts. And it hurts some schools more than others. Fletcher is interesting because only about 3% of the kids in this feeder pattern for Fletcher um, go to a magnet. In fact, a lot of people lie about their address so they can go to Fletcher. Uh, then you take schools like Atlantic Coast, about a quarter of our district goes to Atlantic Coast, about a quarter to Sandalwood. And there, as many as 10 to 14 percent go to an academic magnet. They're not counted in the numbers. And i got to say this about Sandalwood. Uh, it, it's, it's not your grandfather's Sandalwood anymore. Uh, they've done incredible things down there with incredible challenges, and uh, their, their numbers are absolutely outstanding. So that, that is a, a good school, good teachers, uh, and kids with parents working hard to, uh, to make things happen. Okay, uh, we talked a little bit about the, uh, the legislature and uh, what's going on with, uh, with funding. I want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, last year we had a bill called 7069. Uh, instituted a program called Schools of Hope, which provided incentive to certain charter schools. What's interesting is that it created a pool of money, and there are public school uh, entities that can apply for that money. We did have one in the inner city that qualified, so we'll be getting some money for that. But the, the trend is today, and people say, well, it's not fair. Public schools aren't treated equally like charter schools. They're not. Um, and, and, and you need to know this, that, and I don't want to politicize this, it's just a fact, that the people in the legislature do not have faith in the people leading public schools. So they are doing many things to enhance alternative delivery, which are voucher, homeschool, and charter schools. And what a charter school is, and you may not know this, charter schools are public schools that are run by private entities. Some of them are actually philanthropic in nature, where people put money into them, like the KIPP school. Uh, we've got a number in this area that are uh, very popular. Uh, we have uh, uh, River City Science Academy, uh, 
Uh, for every, uh, that's, that's down beach, for every chair they have a student in, they've got some on the waiting list. Um, I think it's called Seacoast. You, Charter USA opened a school over here between uh, Alabama <coughs> County and Chet's Creek. What's interesting is the, uh, uh, we'd love to build a school over there because those schools are so crowded. Alabama County, Chet's Creek, about 130% capacity. And we have lost parents uh, from those schools because of they go in and they see how many kids are there. And it, it just seems so overwhelming. So that school opened, uh, it's full, and we really haven't seen any real production in, in what's going on with Chet's and uh, Alabama County. Of course, Tamaya, the big development down there is going to bring in a, a lot of people. So that's what's going on in Tallahassee. That trend is going to continue. We will continue to see more incentive for charter and alternative delivery, and we're going to continue to see more pressure on finance, finances and funding uh, for public schools, at least in, in the short term. My position has been on the board, we're going to need to solve some of these problems ourselves with revenue sources within the city uh, and mechanisms that make us more efficient. One example would be 23,000 in your school district. Um, last thing I want to talk about before we open up for questions is school um, safety and security. A lot of debate uh, about this issue. Uh, I got involved with this uh, in the legislature uh, before Parkland happened. There was a bill uh, sponsored by the representative from Ocala, uh, Senator Baxley, that would allow anyone with a concealed weapons permit to carry that firearm in a school. Uh, that didn't strike me as a real good idea. In fact, it's interesting, the group that I'm a member of, the Florida Coalition of School Boards, is run by a former Marine. So I called him and said, what do you think about this? Uh, I'm not for that. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, a combat Marine. So, um, we didn't like that idea. And I, I actually was public uh, in, in uh, saying we shouldn't do that. What I did is I got with Senator Baxley's people and talked about an alternative. In fact, there was an alternative, alternative that some schools were already using. Anyone can, well, anyone who's, who can qualify can get a Florida law enforcement certificate. I think it's about 160 hours of training, and they can work as a reserve officer or a special policeman if they're working under the direction of the local law enforcement agency. I said, look, you don't need, and, and what they were looking at was providing security in a lot of these rural schools who can't afford a police department like we have here. And uh, I said, that's how you do it. That's how you do it. Maybe provide a stipend. So we mapped this whole thing out <laughs> as an alternative to concealed weapons in the school in the parking lot. And that's when the Guardian program uh, came about. And there were a couple different versions of that. Eventually they said, no, we're not going to have teachers. We'll have other personnel. Um, it's interesting because we had a resolution against the Guardian plan. I've actually voted against it because obviously I was a part of the recommendation that came out of Tallahassee that would be certainly hypocritical. And then uh, two months later, we had one board meeting between that, we voted the Guardian plan in. And both were six one votes. I voted for the plan that we eventually adopted. So what we came up with was a plan where we would hire specific individuals to be in those schools. We've got our middle schools and our high schools covered with law enforcement. Our school resource officers are actually state police. They have a law enforcement certificate. A lot of these guys and gals are former JSO officers. In fact, uh, our chief, Michael Edwards, the current sheriff, used to work with him. Um, and he's a great guy. In fact, we have, I would say we have a, a true core competency in security in our school system because we have so many uh, veteran JSO officers. And the other thing, a lot of these guys are older. They're 50s, uh, they're, they're retired, it's their second job, and they know about de-escalation techniques. This is something law enforcement is just starting to talk about, and uh, these guys already know all about that. They've been down the road, they've had kids, they've got grandchildren, they're exactly the kind of people we need in a school. Elementary schools want to cover, that's a problem. And, and one of the things that's happened with Parkland is that we kind of had our hand played. Um, so now all the media coverage comes out, and then now everybody knows that, oh, all these schools are now not covered. So what are you going to do? you, you got to do something. And uh, so we are hiring, we're in the process of hiring uh, security personnel. They're called security SSA assistants. Um, they'll be licensed to have a firearm, 
There's a specific program in the state. It's 144 hours, so it's almost at the same level as a law enforcement uh, uh, a law enforcement certificate. And the only thing that they're going to do is provide that level of security in the school. Um, a lot of people were resistant to this. You know, I, I want to I want to try to put your mind at ease about that because there are a lot of security guards and banks and they don't have the training that these guys have. Um, and the other thing is unlike using personnel within the school who have other jobs and other distractions, the only thing these security assistants have to do is keep up with that firearm that they've got. So, and that, and that was one thing that troubled me. If you have random people in the school with a firearm, what happens if that gets away from you? And teachers do different things. Some of them are coaches. So what do you do when you're out there wrestling around with a student, showing him, and you get a firearm? How does that work? Um, and not that I would be completely adverse to, to a teacher being in that role, but again, the issue is keeping up with the firearm. So that's basically uh, where we are today. I'm certainly optimistic uh, about the future. I think education in this country is, uh, is changing. One of the things we're going to see more of is choice. We're going to also see a lot more specificity in education, and we're doing that now, uh, where there are trade programs or specific immersion programs that students have. If you go to a high school today, there's all kinds of different things going on. Like it, they Fletcher had an ACE program. Other schools have AP honors. Um, so it's more like, it's interesting, high school today really is more like a university system uh, because they have these very specific cells of education driven to provide students what they're interested in. And, and everybody knows if you're interested in a subject, you learn more about it. In fact, it's interesting. We have some of the top scores for biology uh, in the state. And, uh, I think it's adolescents and hormones, but uh, <laughs> but uh, I'd, be, I'd love to take some questions and and uh, yes, sir. <laughs> this is Sean. I think it's so secret that you're going to vacation to the spot there over the um, school board. Now, what advice would you have for someone that's going to uh, occupy that seat once you leave? And the other part is, uh, what would you do differently? Um, wow. <laughs> I'm Sam Hall, by the if, way. If I knew what to tell you, if I knew what to tell you, I'd probably run for the election. Um, it's a very challenging, you know, I, I think that the education uh, is different. And, and one of the things that you need to know is it does not welcome outsiders. All are welcome, but you may not like a welcoming committee. Um, it is uh, by nature provincial. And uh, uh, a guy like me who ha has a very hard time in that environment. Um, so I think what the secret is, is to look at small incremental change. Um, also is to understand what the job is and to do that job. The administration is responsible for teaching students. The superintendent is the chief educational officer. Uh, the board members are responsible for the physical plan, they're responsible for funding, and they're responsible for policy, which means engaging with the state legislature. Um, it's interesting, we're state constitutional officers, just like the tax collector and the property appraiser, so we have a state role, and technically um, a, a, a job to do with the, the state of Florida. And one of the things I would really concentrate on is the relationship with the members of the state legislature. It's completely hostile now. And people in education will say, no, it's not. Well, you see them three times in the past five years. They, they made a decision and you sued them. <laughs> How is that not hostile? And 7069, they dropped a bomb in your backyard. How is that not hostile? So we've got to break this relationship of these two groups fighting and get back on the same page, say, okay, what's good for kids? And look, here's what I did when I was trying to make a decision. And, and you know, the, the big job you do is you vote. The superintendent puts things on the agenda. And, and you support it. And the first thing I would look at, number one, is it ethical? And does it support your oath of office, which is to uphold the law and the Constitution? So the first thing to say, is it ethical? And is it within the law? Um, the second thing, this is different than I would say for other elected positions. The second thing that you look at is, what's the best thing for kids? And let me tell you something, we're not doing it. 
Uh, we're focused a lot on the issues of adults, not kids. If this were about kids, this would look real different. <laughs> and number three is, what do your constituents want you to do? You're representative of the public. So what, every decision, so what do the people in my district want? And this is a typically a very conservative district. What do they want? And what are my views? My views are not important. Views of the public. And always vote with what the public wants. Now, where you get to a problem with that is where it comes right down the middle. School uniforms. Oh, yeah. Um, that, that came in. And here's the thing, too. The majority said do it. Like 54% do it. And uh, initially, I was for it because I liked a lot of things about it. And I'm a big safety guy. Um, and I teach safety in, in various uh, programs. And uh, I love the idea of here's a student going down the street or sidewalk in a, in a uniform. And people know, hey, that's a, that's a school, uh, a member of a school, keep an eye on them, watch out for them. Are they in the wrong place? Are they going the wrong way? Uh, think about the security implications of that. But the thing that finally came to pass after we did the surveys and studies with school uniforms is the people that are for it, eh, we're kind of for it. The people that were against it, that's a minority, it's something like 47%. They hate it. I mean, they were, it was just visceral. So when you see that, it's close, but, and it's a minority, but it would cause such a disruption. That's why I said, you know what? This doesn't work. We can't take that many people in the system and create this much fuss over something that is, it, it could be kind of good, but it ain't work, you know, what it could do in terms of upsetting people. And the other thing is we have a track record of taking good ideas and blow and, and, and just Poor execution. We'll, we'll do it halfway. You can't do it halfway. I'm a fan of year-round schools, but I'm certainly not a fan of how we did it before because we did it before. You can't go into these things halfway committed. We'll do this and we'll do that. You got to make it work. What's interesting too, if you're looking for high school, junior high school, year-round schools, you probably pay the average average teacher in terms of benefits around fifty thousand dollars. You could probably get that number of year-round schools up to close to seventy, uh, between seventy-five thousand dollars a year, but you get a full-time job. No uh, three months in Costa Rica. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Um, just getting back to the safety issue, I'm just wondering whether the board and the school district um, are familiar or versed in the Sandy Hook Plans programs, if there's been any discussion on implementing those programs in the schools. Um, I'm not, so tell us about that, please. Well, it was started from the Sandy Hook Foundation, and they are free programs that um, I am not one of the trainers, but there are trainers completely uh, dedicated to this who will come to your school, speak to the administration, speak to the school board on all of the programs there from elementary school uh, age up through high school, and they are specifically designed to prevent students from being lost in the shuttle. And the elementary to help start the up, it's about engaging kids right from the get-go. And all the way up through um, a suicide prevention program, a hotline. Um, they do all kinds of interactive training with students, with teachers, on how to evaluate students, how to help them, what to do if they're feeling at all upset or concerned about a student. And it's really a whole program to engage student bodies togetherness and support for each other. I, I thank you for sharing that with me. I think you bring up a good point. Uh, one of the things we've done too much of with these issues is what do we do after uh, 911 is ringing? That doesn't work. So we really do need to look at programs and methods and something different. Something different than what we're doing. When, you know, when 911 rings, the failure's already happened. Right. Um, um, so I, I, I applaud what you're saying and I think that needs to happen. And let me let me say this about the beach. Right after that event, we met, in fact, Mayor Brown, she deserves uh, a salute for this. She was the first one that called me and said, what are we going to do? Let's do something. And I said, okay, let's go get them. So we all got out here in the Neptune Beach uh, City Hall, we went with the police department. Uh, we had Atlantic Beach there. Uh, Michelle Cook was there. Uh, our school police chief and the tenant were there. We went over all the procedures. It was impressive. What happened at Parkland? It would look very different 
in, in, in Jackson Hole, Florida, especially in the beaches here. Uh, essentially what, and, and they're all coordinated, so what would happen uh, is you would have the first responder, school resource officer, or the safety officer to respond. All of the agencies in the beach are going to be alerted. They're all on the same frequency, you can hear each other's calls, and they are all going to respond. Then you're going to have JSO responding, and of course your, your fire rescue. So the, the, the amount of effort and the amount of law enforcement people that would be on the scene here and the other thing that they were doing is they were getting like the local police guys to come in school and look around, get a feel for what the building looks like. Uh, a lot of planning, uh, very impressive. I was, I was very energized after the discussion and uh, uh, no one, you know, I'm not disparaging anybody, but I didn't see anybody in that room that would be standing outside waiting and trying to figure out what's going on. And so I, I think we've got a good thing here. And, um, you know, hopefully that's not going to happen. And hopefully the programs and the things that you're talking about. Um, Would this be something I could bring to the organizers? Yes, in fact, if you bring it to me, I'll get that in the system okay. because I think that's, that's just something that's missing. So we need to look more about that prevention. And we also need to look at why this is happening. If you look at the, the people who, who do this, it's the same people. It's young, white men. And most of the programs are um, designed by psychiatrists school administrators who've studied this for decades on how do we engage students so that they don't feel at all uh, left out, um, ostracized, have prevent bullying programs in a meaningful way. Yes, ma'am. Good. What else? Yes, yes sir. <clears throat> um, John, you know I've spoken before the school board a number of times this year. Uh, and it's in regard to the way history is taught. I'm part of a coalition in town um, that is actually an international movement now to remove Confederate statues um, because of what they represented when they went up, the period they went up, and how they were used to instill fear uh, and to intimidate the African American community. Uh, when we started doing this, what came to us right away was the lack of education, the lack of history being taught in our schools about the period, the period regarding slavery, the 80 years after slavery during segregation, so the rights movement that really are today. Uh, I think it's very important that all of our children, white, black, and others, really get a full breadth of the history of America. And when we don't do that, we're allowing our children to grow up with a lot of misinformation or no information at all. So you know, like I said, I've spoken to you, or spoken before the board a number of times. And I'd just like to get your take on it because nobody's ever really responded. <laughs> Um, it's interesting, the last time you spoke, I did speak at the end, we have a thing called For the Record. And uh, I brought, um, and I've done a little research into this, uh, into this issue. Um, a lot of these uh, schools were named after Confederate generals. I never even knew who they were. Finnegan, maybe I was like, who is that? You know, and it turns out that's an Irishman who is some guy, and, and you know, um, a lot of this was done as a reaction to Brown versus Board of Education. Some of these monuments were actually erected around the turn of the century or in the early or late 1800s around the, uh, uh, the, the soldiers groups, the soldiers memorials. Uh, I know because my great grandfather was one of them. In fact, there were articles in the newspaper. In the north and the south, uh, there were thousands and thousands of veterans that would meet in different communities. Uh, my great grandfather met on the Canal Street Bridge in Lynchburg, Virginia. And I actually found an article in 1914, uh, Richmond Times Dispatch, where he was one of the last three. And I'd always heard the story when I was a kid about how he was the last one of all the survivors uh, to go to that bridge and bring in the new year. And uh, uh, I never knew it was true until I found this article about, you know, he was one of the last three. But with schools specifically, we did have this issue with Brown versus Board of Education, 
to protest that they put these names on the school. Um, that's not appropriate. And it was done as an act of rebellion. Um, I think we really do have to look at history and we have to look at why we did things. So with schools, that's a lot of the issue. Um, Joseph Finnegan, uh, I thought Desmond Waters might be a good name for that, <laughs> that school. Um, but there's always going to be a lot of resistance to that. And uh, I do think we need to look also at what we teach um, our young African Americans in, this, in our school district. Um, today we are, are sending a message to them about victimization. Um, I think we're sending the wrong message to, to the African American community. I think leadership uh, needs to be stronger there. And uh, we need to start showing people in all of the communities that they can be winners and they can be successful and uh, insulate people against uh, these types of things that can be demeaning. So I think a big problem that we have and one of the reasons we have so many dysfunctional things happening in our society is that uh, we have a culture that puts people down. Uh, whether it's this group or that group or we have these TV shows now. I, I'm actually kind of surprised by some of these talent shows where the judges just rip people Part. Is that the America that I grew up in? No, it's, it's not. But we now have this hostile and sensitive thing going in this country. I don't like it. I don't think it's helpful. Um, I think we do need to recognize education, the Brown versus Board of Education issues. And a lot of states have done that with the flags, which was also the impetus for why they changed uh, their flags, like in Georgia, I think South Carolina, and the others. And now they've gone back. So that was obviously no one is for segregation today but we still have some of those legacies. Um, I'm open-minded about changing, but, but i got five months to get it done. <laughs> yes, sir? I have a question, Scott. Um, I have a boy going into fifth at Jacks Beach Elementary, and so I've been paying close attention to the school safety assistant um, policy, plus I'm, like Sam, running for school board district, too. <laughs> um, one of the things that I found really interesting and uh, appreciate about it is the from learning about it from the school police, they're going to do the same mental health checks and the same background checks as sworn officers get, um, which is fantastic. But it was also approved in May, and they've all got to be fielded by mid-August. Do you know, have an idea of how well it's going so far? Well, well it's, how well is a relative term? <laughs> uh, finding the talent. Now we have, we're trying to do this in the wake of um, basically full employment and these jobs that they pay about $12 an hour. So the problem is finding those individuals. One of the groups that we're targeting are those applicants for JSO jobs. So apparently for every about five uh, JSO applicants that are qualified, that could do the job, they pick one of those. So there's a bunch of folks that might be too young or too experienced. Uh, perhaps they, they could be in this position or on the other end, folks that are retired from military or law enforcement, but people in general that have a clean background. And your background, as you said, has to be really clean yeah. uh, to, to get this job. But that's a problem. I think we've got about 25 or so, or about a quarter of the way there. And uh, we are looking at, and there has been discussion about, is this something we would open up to the other employees uh, in, the, in the school? So someone else who works in the, the school and is allowable in the statute whether or not they would be an applicant. I, I think it's important that we do this. Yeah. Um, there is some discussion that the law is not, uh, uh, well, you could violate it with impunity. So some counties have said, we're just not going to do it. Um, now that we have advertised that these schools do not have the security. The other thing is we, we are doing a good job of going around and looking at tightening up, you know, closing doors. And the problem is, like the students, somebody's not where they're supposed to be, and they put a pencil on the door so they can get back in, but be more vigilant about that. That also plays into the issue of uh, the infrastructure. A lot of these schools are older. I mean, if you first time I ever went into Fletcher, I'm like, how do you get in here? And where's the front door? And there is not really a front door. Uh, and there's doors everywhere. And I'll tell you what, I go to a lot of these older schools, and they've been built on and added on to, and I just go bust them through a door. And they're like, how'd you get through here? That door's open. And then the principal usually gets pretty hot. Yeah. <laughs> but 
being vigilant about closing the doors and good security. Um, I think that's that's uh, that's important. And what's interesting too is that we, we've done a lot of you know, and the thing that we get into in our society, we really put bad news uh, under the microscope and we live with it day and night. You know, when these things happen, you turn on the news channels, and the time you wake up, the time you go to bed, you're going to hear about whatever it was—a train wreck or plane crash or shooting is over and over and over again. Uh, we don't have a news station that tells you about all the times that this didn't happen, that you know, a mental health worker reached out to someone, you know, a teacher reached out. Um, how many times did this not happen? Uh, so that's something to keep in mind too. And uh, what's the general health you know, of your community and the outlook and, the, and the, the, the ability of people to have that kind of dialogue uh, pursuant to that? Uh, we do have an issue with kids bringing guns to school, and uh, it's not that big. I mean, we're, we have 125,000 kids, which is about the size of the average county population, median county in, in the state of Florida. So we get you know, 10 to 15 guns a year brought to school. Uh, the most common way we find out about the gun today is a kid tells us a teacher. So there, there was a culture 15 years ago of you don't tell anybody anything. That's changing. People are speaking up. And, and when you look at the kind of issues we, we deal with with Parkland and Sandy Hook, um, that may be changing just because of the fact that people are now aware of it. And they're, they're going to speak up, whereas they didn't, didn't before. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Are there any candidates running for governor this year that you're really excited about their educational agenda? No. <laughs> Um, I, I will say this, I met with uh, Adam Putnam at uh, Angie's Subs. Oh, oh yeah, if you want to get elected, you better be at Angie's Subs. And uh, uh, he was uh, uh, working on a Peruvian when I caught up to him. Uh, he has uh, a couple of young kids, and, uh, and he was not a supporter of House Bill 7069. Uh, and one of the problems with 7069 was it moved infrastructure money uh, to charters, and uh, that you know, put us in a, in a deeper hole. Uh, a lot of people weren't for that particular aspect of the bill. In general, the, the bill itself, there were good things in it, but that was one that was a bit hard to swallow. Uh, but, uh, you know, we, we've got some good folks. It, it's interesting, too, when you meet most people running for office, they really want to do good things for the community. Uh, most of them have families, and uh, uh, the problem is today, so much of what we see in the media is, is nothing about what they're really about and what they're really going to do. Um, and the attack ads and all that, they're already on Ron DeSantis about his condom, and <laughs> which I have no idea whether or not that's true or not, but um, that's unfortunate because we, we get into this and we don't know. Uh, the, the specifics, but I do know that, that Putnam has young children, and uh, we talked about education. Um, um, you, you might be surprised I don't hang out with a lot of governors and governor uh, candidates, but uh, he, he was one that I met. I think uh, the, the, the thing, too, that's important to know is where this decision is made. And this decision with education is made frequently uh, within the uh, uh, Florida legislature, which is the funding dynamic. And then you have another body, uh, which is the Florida Board of Education, and the administrative side of that is the Department of Education. And uh, so they also are a rulemaking body, which a lot of people don't even know that they exist. So we have things like BAM scores and other uh, <laughs> issues. <laughs> That's how teachers' performance are measured. I, actually, I have a background in statistic. I looked at this thing, I can't make heads or tails out of it. And I know it has problems. I, and I didn't make heads or tails out of it. Yeah, and, 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 and no one believed that hers was wrong. And she showed me the data. She caught me over here at the first Peaches Watch meeting and said, this can't be right. And I looked at it and I said, you're right. That can't be right. That wasn't right. But anyway, there, there's quite a chain of different players in education that are important. And the Board of Education is appointed. And then the administration uh, within that group is, is also critical. Uh, it's a big system. You know, if you look at in Duval County, we're the biggest employer. Uh, we have about 11,500 total employers. That makes us the largest domestic uh, employer. Our budget is $1.73 billion. 
Uh, that's about a half a billion dollars more than the city itself. So uh, it's a very, very big system in getting the right people. It's really not one person. It's not like an education governor. Everybody's going to tell you, oh yeah, not the education governor. But it's the individuals. And what's interesting is the real power players in education have been the House speakers in the last uh, few years, most notably uh, Speaker Corbyn. Yes, yes ma'am. Hi, my name is Rena Springle. And I was one of the 200 people that showed up at the board meeting last night downtown, along um, with these four others here, representing the Seaside. And our charter school does fall in your district. And I had some questions for you, Mr. Shine. Uh, the first one is, what is your position on uh, Seaside getting their charter amended for up through eighth grade? And is there any insight you can give us on the progress that's being made to work towards that goal? Um, I've been supporting Seaside's uh, additional grades for months and working on that issue. Uh, apparently there has been some miscommunication between our people and your people. Ron Harding is your chair. Um, I've talked to him quite frequently. Uh, talked to him today. There was a meeting with the superintendent and uh, they, he said that they made good progress. Um, adding this, you know, charter schools have a contract. We're the charter authorizer today. So they come to us, uh, there's a series of uh, uh, items in statute, and if a charter application effectively addresses those items, then we must approve their application. There's not a discretionary function. Um, today, in fact, because of 7069, uh, they've always had this right. It uh, if we deny it and we don't have a legal basis to deny it, it then goes back to Tallahassee and they can have an appeal. And that appeal then is forced upon the district in terms of granting or not granting. We get also, if they don't make the standards, we are supposed to not grant a charter. So we are the authorizer today. Uh, because of 7069, if there's an appeal and we lose, we have to pay the fees. Because so many of the their boards like Paul B. It just starts saying, no, no, no charter. We don't want charter. And this is what happened. And, and I'll say this, and this is also important, especially for the educators in the room. And I don't want this to sound harsh, um, but there are people within that are supposedly representing education that are burning your house down. And some of these union people and the hostility that's directed at Tallahassee. So now, and they are in Tallahassee's pro charter. Um, I'm pro student, I'm pro citizen. Um, so now, if, if uh, of course, if we have an appeal, it goes to the state, and if we lose, we have to pay their fees. Uh, but there is a legislation process now where the state will be the authorizer, which that then takes that responsibility out of our hands. So more and more responsibility for being a local authorizer and regulator is being removed from our power and being moved to the state. And this is a trend that's going to continue. So until there is some change in this relationship uh, between the unions, you know, and I, when I got into this, I was not a big fan of the charter school idea. Um, I've come around on that. Because it, there's just no, again, I don't want to sound harsh about this, but it's the truth. These people, uh, I'm 58 years old, I've worked at Fortune 10 corporations. I've worked in the highest levels of corporate organizations. I've worked in nonprofits. I've been an appointed public official. I've never seen a more hostile um, group of people. And that is hurting education and it's hurting teachers. So the people that are supposed to be helping teachers are, are not. They, they, and, and most of what these unions do, they represent people that should be fired. Okay? We had a case. Um, and you need to know this. You need to know what's going on in education. Um, we had an employee who was looking at pornography on his computer in the classroom. He fired him. He appealed it to an administrative law judge who said, you need to put him back in the classroom. That's the kind of thing we deal with. Um, we have teachers, in fact, I had one a couple of weeks ago, some teacher put their hands on a student and dropped them off. And I saw the report and I said, no. This is not a 30-day suspension. This is out the door. I said, we'll get sued. I don't care. And I got to the point with the administration. I said, look, 
if this person did this at a Walmart or a charter school or a private school or a Bank of America, and they'd be fired, then they should be fired from our system because who's, number one, was ethical. Number two, it's about the kids. Number three, it's about the citizens. And number four, it's about 99% of the teachers who are working their butts off and being held back because all these resources are going literally to a handful of people. We had one, this will get you a 30 day suspension, um, investigating someone drinking on the job. This is my favorite. Uh, went to this teacher's file cabinet, opened the file cabinet, and there's a liquor bottle rattling around in the file cabinet. That got you 30 days. And, uh, and it's interesting because there are new teachers who come into our system who haven't been there that long. So they're under contract. They're under a different set of rules. So you look at the number of those educators that are terminated every year. It's pretty high. Um, but if you look at those outside of that boundary, it's almost non-existent. And I've told people, I say, you know, we have to vote on every educator termination. And I say, I know who's going to be fired because I'm going to see them on the 6 o'clock news and half the time they wear handcuffs. That's not a joke. And so when we look at all the things that are hurting public education um, in public schools and public school teachers, that's one of them. And that's why we have this charter movement. That's why we have a voucher movement. That's why we have a home school movement. And that is being facilitated by the legislature. Now, in this room, I've used this analogy before. It's like the parable of Solomon. Two women come to Solomon for judgment and claim that the child is theirs. Solomon says, well, I'll take the child and cut him in half with my sword. I'll give half to you and half to you. Well, the real mother relinquishes the child. Because he wants the child to live. Well, we got two different sides here with the sword. And I don't see anybody claiming real ownership of the kids. So that's one thing we deal with. And that's something that weighs heavy on my heart. Uh, I've got a teacher question. Yes, sir. Okay. <clears throat> Attendance policy. Do you all discuss this at all? Yeah, the what policy? Attendance. For teachers? No. For <laughs> students. For, for students. Uh, we do. And uh, in fact, that's an issue. We have uh, some ridiculous absenteeism. Um, I've gone on record with uh, uh, the district and, and the public and the press. I've gotten on the news. And, and, and I hope people would see this that it's against the law. You could be charged with crime if you don't send your kid to school. Compulsory. But why can't we have, and I'm just going to, why can't we make a policy that's got some teeth? Yes. Okay, I've been in since 85. Okay? From 85 to about 95. If you missed five days and a quarter, you failed. With the option of a teacher giving you the work to make up, and you make that grade up. Okay, now here's what happened. Let's just take a number. Ten kids in a class. Six of them would make the work up. The other four would fail. Because that's who they are. Now, I've got kids passing my class, missing 26 days in a year. So you divide that by four and you figure out the numbers. There's nothing, and, and it's one of the most frustrating things about the classroom. So here's my question. Is there any way we can make a policy with teeth? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. And, and that's the board that we would set that policy. And I'd love to see it happen. And I know it's not, listen, I know it's number 20 on your list of 19 things. It is. It is. That, that, interestingly enough, that was one of them. It was kind of high with me, and because uh, I had a personal case with, with one of those, uh, not my case. Um, but uh, there is a, a strong relationship between absenteeism, academic achievement, and dropout. In fact, there's a program called City Year, uh, where there are young people who come, and that's one of the triggers. When they see absenteeism, they then reach out to the child and try to bring them back in, knowing that is a predictor. Of, uh, of dropout. The other thing is if you deal with uh, children who have disabilities uh, like dyslexia and dysgraphia and others, they've got to be at school every day. But I mean that, that's got to change. That's yes. one of the, that is to let you know we've got five months left. Okay? That is one of the things killing morale 
in, in the classroom is that you can have somebody miss 10 days and nine weeks. And the kid that's here every day has got an A, and that kid can make it. Because you've got to give him enough time to make up for it. I so, agree with you 100%. I'll tell you what we can do to put that in there. I've, I've pushed that before, and uh, I, I think it's important. Plant a seed before you leave. Yeah. No, I, I, but that's, that's critical. The other thing we know, too, is that absenteeism, a lot of these kids will also be involved in a criminal event right. or possibly a victimization. Event. Terms. But, uh, uh, yeah, they need to be in school. Yeah, I've even had this lecture. I've had this with parents. I, I, you know, a parent has a kid who has a minor learning disability. I'm like, this, this kid needs to be in school every day. It's not an issue of how they feel when they got up that morning. Every day. Every day. And, but, you know, that's, that's part of the issue, too, is parents and what is their level of responsibility. We're not going to go down that road. No. <laughs> Ms. Glasser, I believe. Mayor Glasser. I'll stop talking. I do want to say thank you very much for what you do. I, um, it's a hard job. I'm still reeling from the $62 million shortfall, wondering what's going to give on that. Do you know what's going to give on that? Teachers. Uh, can, yeah. can I help you with that? Yeah. We are 60, at Fletcher, we have lost to budget. Eight teachers three years ago, four teachers two years ago, and we're losing, we're, we're retiring six. So that's 12 and six. That's 18 positions that are not going to be filled in three years because of budget. With the same amount, the same school population. And it's all because of budget. And, and, and that's, and, and a lot of positions that we'll be cutting are those things that are ancillary, like reading coaches, librarians, uh, the things that we added. You know, it's interesting because we look at the reforms and a lot of things that we added, we're now cutting those, uh, cutting those back. Um, it, it's, it's interesting because when you look at real dollars, and that's something a lot of people bring up, you take that by inflation, uh, we're already down. So this is that Okay. You got to say it?